All right. So um, I'm Amy Olson. I work with Advocate Healthcare. Uh, I'm based out of the Midwest. Uh, Advocate Healthcare is uh, third or fourth largest not-for-profit healthcare system in the country. Um, so we got a lot of things going on. I've been with the organization for about 23 years, uh, been in various different roles um, during that tenure, anything from electronic health records to lab systems to corporate systems, and now working on ERP and workforce management. So happy to be here. And uh, Nicole, you wanna do your introduction? Thanks, Amy. Good morning. My name is Nicole Kirkenbush, and um, I currently work with CHIME, which is a professional association for digital health leaders. Um, at that organization, I'm in charge of our membership and our education pieces. But um, prior to that, I spent 24 years in the Army as an Army nurse, and half of that I did on sort of that IT side, and I've been in CIO roles and CMIO roles and um, helped to lead a development shop at one point, helped to acquire an electronic health record for the DOD. Um, and then when I retired from the Army, I spent seven years at our local health system. I live in South Dakota. Um, and so if there's anybody out there, I'll, I'm watching the chat. If anyone out there is from South Dakota, drop that in there because I rarely get anyone on any calls from South Dakota. <laughs> um, but we're a, a small but mighty state. Um, but I live in the on the west side and I worked at our health system there for seven years after retirement as the VP of analytics. I had quality at one point, patient experience, project management. And when I left there, I had been the chief nursing officer for four years along with some of the IT pieces that I had. So it was a great seven years, but it was also during the pandemic and we all know how that went. So it's been nice to come over to Chime and work in now a different aspect of digital health, IT, IIS, IM, all those areas. So thanks for having us today, Kristen. It's really great. And I'll hand it over to Linda to let her introduce herself. Good afternoon, everybody. Great, great to be here with these uh, lovely women. Um, my name is Linda Stevenson. I'm the Chief Information Officer at Fisher Titus Health, which is a rural healthcare organization in Northwest Ohio been in the field for about, oh, well, I'm not going to tell you how long, but it's almost 40 years, really, uh, in, always in healthcare and in various aspects. I'm a project manager, so I got into things like HIPAA back in the day, rolling out on major EMRs at everything from small organizations to large organizations like the Cleveland Clinic. So pretty excited to be here to share a little bit with you about um, my journey and our journey. And I just want to say that, you know, one of the things I love about being a leader in health tech is there's never a boring day in my career. Uh, I wake up every day knowing that I get to come in and help help patients in, in a way that I wouldn't, I, I'm not a nurse and it, I've not been able, that's not something that I would have been strong at, but I still get to help patients and those that help patients every single day. Well, hopefully everyone can hear me now, first of all. So I apologize <laughs> if that wasn't a lesson in leadership and technology coming to a terrific um, crashing moment. Uh, I don't know what is, but my name's Kristen Russell. I am hosting this panel. I did just lose connection, but I'm back now. And you can see we've got some really uh, terrific folks joining us today. I will say this whole idea of bringing female leaders in technology together was kind of born out of a conversation with our Simpler Women's Network. And here at Simpler, we've got a couple of different employee resource groups covering a variety of topics. Veterans group, we've got working parents, uh, we've got a group focused on kind of different religious backgrounds, but this group, the Simpler Women's uh, Network said, hey, you know what, we really wanna understand healthcare leaders and a little bit about how they got to where they are today. Kind of what's the journey that they've been on? And so I'm gonna ask you guys, cause we've just been chit chatting about this, about your career journey. Like what did it take to kind of get to the spot that you're actually sitting in a webinar right now, uh, chit chatting around uh, healthcare IT? And maybe um, Linda, can I, if I'm, I'm gonna start with you and we'll kind of bounce it around a little bit. Sure. Um, I think one of the interesting things to note is that I didn't start, I don't have an education in technology. I wasn't a programmer. I didn't grow up that way. And that wasn't what I planned to get into. Um, went into getting a um, degree in business management, which at that point was useless because I didn't know anything to manage. So um, I, I took the jobs that you know, nobody else really wanted. I started out in the billing revenue cycle and it was what we call it today revenue cycle. Believe it or not, I was typing UV82s on a typewriter. 
And um, I, I just asked a lot of questions. I was, I was the person who was always like saying, why, why, why? And, and it's, at one point, the IT leaders in that organization came to me and said, we would love you to come and work for us. And I panicked. It was not the plan in my head. And it was a little scary. But I took the leap of faith and I've been in IT and never looked back a day ever since. Um, it's been such a blessing. But I think the, the key is you never know where your career is going to take you. And who would have thought I would be here in this role years later? I feel like that's going to resonate with somebody else on this panel. Um, and um, you all can't see who I'm looking at, but there's a gal on the panel with images in behind her um, behind her head of army uh, kind of pictures. Nicole, I feel like you did not have the straight route either into healthcare tech. Yeah, and, and I almost would say, does anyone? I, I don't know if anyone does. Um, I And I ended up as a nurse because frankly, the army was willing to pay for my college if I, if I did that for four years. And I said, well, I can do anything for four years. That sounds fine. Um, 24 years later after graduation is when I finally retired, not my plan, um, but it really worked out and I got great education, great experiences, met my husband in the army, had two kids in, in an Air Force hospital, like that became very much a part of shaping my leadership journey. And one of the things I've learned about the civilian world is that you don't always get leadership training given to you or asked, or you're not asked to go to it just automatically. Whereas in the military, you are a leader no matter what rank you are you're leading something or someone and they don't really let you get away with sticking around and not sending you to leadership training and that's something that for me i really probably took for granted until i retired and realized not everybody gets that um, i think for me getting into kind of the it side came through working in quality um, and preparing for a joint commission um, in inspection, which many of you probably know who Joint Commission is. And if you don't, at Simpler, that is one of our accrediting bodies and their surveys are very um, intense and very um, a, a significant emotional event for many people. And so getting ready for that showed me how much having access to information, how important that was in healthcare. And that took me into the informatics world and wanting to get more training in informatics. Um, and that's kind of what put me on this path. Uh, I ended up really enjoying that and finding that there is real power in the data and power to make decisions, power to make a difference, power to get people on board with you if you're trying to get a project going or trying to make um, a change in an organization. And so that's probably really what got me there. I agree with Linda, you be, you know, be open to the doors that might show themselves when you weren't expecting one. Maybe it's a little bit like the Winchester Castle. I've never been there, but I hear, you know, you go through that Winchester Castle and there are doors that go nowhere. And then there are doors that go downstairs you didn't even know were there. And then there's um, passageways that you maybe can't find. To me, that might be a good analogy for how I got to where I am. It's it's trying things out and taking a chance. And Amy. Castle, yeah, Amy. Um, I probably am maybe the more traditional. Um, I actually went to college for a math degree and uh, had a little extra time and some friends encouraged me to take some computer science classes and ended up really in computer science because that's at least when I graduated from college, I could get a job. Most of my friends couldn't get a job. It was not a great economy that year. Um, so really, I ended up in pure programming. I worked for a supercomputer company and I was miserable. Um, I, I cried every night. I, I Lock me in a room with a computer is really not a good good fit for Amy. So um, I ended up making a shift into consulting and uh, spent about six, seven years bouncing around in different industries. And frankly, I started as a consultant even at, at the time, Aurora Healthcare, and had the opportunity to work with Cerner. And I know there's some folks that maybe have some Cerner background in here as well. Um, on developing their nursing and ancillary documentation. There was nothing in the box at the time, and we were a partner in developing that. So really got an opportunity to kind of dig in deep with healthcare, and about nine months after we started the project, they were gonna hire for my role, and I kind of 
can mm -hmm. I stay? <laughs> um, and, you know, as I said, you know, 23, actually 24, if you count my nine months, um, 24 years later, you know, it's, it's really been the, the best choice that I could have ever made. And, you know, I think, you know, for myself, being open to doing different things. Um, you know, I mentioned at the top, you know, I've done electronic health record. I did lab. I've done corporate systems. I've done ERP, you know, um, turning over a new leaf, at least for me, every few years keeps it fresh and keeps it interesting. And, you know, as I've, you know, looked at the different opportunities that have come my way, um, it's scary jumping into something you don't know, but for me, that's where the excitement comes is, you know, when I actually do have to write notes and write things down because I won't remember it tomorrow if I, if I don't keep track. So, um, you know, I think there's, healthcare is very broad. You know, it's an industry where, yes, our sole purpose is to take care of patients and, and provide health care, but it's a microcosm of all other industries. There's marketing, there's technology, there's, you know, consulting, there, you know, whatever, whatever business line you can think of, supply chain, right? All of that lives under the umbrella of healthcare and, and what kinds of opportunities that presents to, to anybody who's curious and, and interested in, in growing and potentially leading, I think is, is really exciting. You know, it's funny, um, as I was talk as I was listening to each of you talk about your backgrounds, I'm a chief marketing officer here at Simpler, and you might think, oh, I just kind of have always done marketing. I, I actually started in technology, um, built, started my own tech company, uh, online billing and invoicing, but it was born out of consulting. Um, and like you, Amy, kind of started with roots in tech and then grew into healthcare tech, basically just by nature, uh, virtue of being in Kansas City. Uh, and Cerner was there and it was one of three tech companies. Mm -hmm. Hey, you know what? I'll go work in healthcare tech. It's Garmin, Sprint, mm -hmm. or Garmin. let's see how that goes. Uh, and then one thing that leads to the next from strategy into marketing. But I think the, the note that you made, Linda, you never quite know where things are going to go. You just sort of jump in that canoe and go down the river and, and see where it takes you. Yeah. You know, speaking of like, we're kind of rolling with things. Uh, let's talk a little bit about kind of career balance. Cause I, I feel like as women, we, I shouldn't say what, people these days, we balance a lot. A lot of working parents um, have a lot of different things that they're juggling. And there's, there's pros and cons to all of it. There's some rules to live by. I know this was a hot topic last week at the Chime CIO uh, session as well, but you know, talk to me guys about kind of your thoughts on balance. What is an average I don't know, Monday this week? It's Tuesday with Veterans Day. But how do you balance work life responsibilities and what does an average Monday look like for you? In my world, uh, so for reference in rural health care, I um, wear many hats. So I'm obviously the CIO, I'm also the CISO, the CDO, the CTO, you know, whatever other acronym you want to come up with, um, I cover all of that. So balancing is really hard, but it's also that makes it that much more important because I have to make sure that I'm ready, that, my, that I'm protecting my health, protecting my, my ability to rest. And so I, I get up at 5.30 or 6 in the morning, depending on the day. Um, I take a little alone time in the morning, check emails, uh, take a breath and then get ready for work, head in, and then, you know, work, work the day, the crazy day that we have, which is back-to-back -back meetings, typically. Uh, on my way home, I make sure I listen to books that take me away from work. So it's not um, books or podcasts about what I do during the day. It's something that's different. So get that mental shift between work and home. First thing I do when I get home is I change into the yoga clothes, put the ponytail on the top of my head, and go, okay, now I'm in home, Linda which I think for me is helpful to separate the mindset and the mind mm -hmm. shift from one to the other. It's, it's then about getting some exercise in because when we sit all day like this, it's really hard. So I make sure I exercise, eat right, get a good night's sleep. And yes, sometimes there's work peppered in there in the, in the evenings, but I make sure I take that moment to shift over first and then fit that in, make that a priority. I think that's important. And I think it's also important to have something else that you do outside of work. So, there might, you know, for me, it's yoga. I'm a yoga teacher. And um, I think that's my alter ego, but it's also kept me with the strength to do what I do during the day. And then it, the work I do during the day makes me appreciate yoga. So the, the balance is important. And I think we all need something that brings that balance. Balance. Mm -hmm. 
Amen. Nicole, what are your thoughts? What do you think about that? Yeah, I think balance to me, I get this picture of the scale, right? The the traditional old school scale. And it's, it is to me, it's always sort of like, okay, which one's lower, which one's higher, add a little more to one side, add a little more to the other. And I, I don't know if it's ever really truly balanced. Um, and and we talk to often at Chime in our leadership discussions about, is it really work-life balance or is it just life balance? Because work is part of life, so is your family, so are your self-preservation activities, your um, community activities, your church activities. There's so many things to balance. And I think a lot of it too um, comes with seasons in life as well where you know we were talking a little bit in preparation for this all of us are in a little bit of a different place with our families um and you know i've got one in college one ready to get off to college that's very different than someone who has maybe um you know kids pre-kindergarten toddlers uh, i i remember those days there's parts of it i love and miss and there's a lot of it i didn't and I, and so how do we also find what our personal needs are at the time um, and some things i think that are important are really understanding with your team what is important to each of them making sure they know what's important to you um, some things i do you know i always put on my calendar my personal stuff i mean there's some very personal things i put and it's private maybe a doctor's appointment or something but if it's family stuff like my daughter has a play coming up her play is on the calendar so people know mm -hmm. hey that's not going to be a good time that day right up to the time of play to get an important meeting with nicole like that isn't the best thing to do right there and and i encourage my folks to do that too because we all have those things and if we're going to say hey no that stuff has to stay separate i think we're going to not retain people um that's it's becoming much more of a open discussion which i do like um about how do we help our our teams achieve balance and then we have to model it ourselves for that for them. So, uh, it's it's a it's a daily I think activity, I, and I don't want to say struggle because it's it's just part of life. And knowing what's important to you, I think, really helps you choose where you're gonna where you're gonna put more weight on one side of the scale or the other. So, right, you reference the seasons of life, and I and I think back, you know. It, Right now, I've got a lot more autonomy across my own calendar, my time. I work from home, not today, but generally. Um, so, so balance is maybe something that's easier to achieve. But if I think back to, you know, when my kids were in grade school and, you know, it, I was in the office and I was doing some traveling and, you know, we were more structured and I didn't have as much autonomy across my calendar. And, you know, at that point in, in time, you know, it, it really, it became kind of a team sport, you know, I, I, or to quote, you know, it takes a village. It's, it's who are those support people that you're going to partner with. You're not going to make every sporting event, but you're going to put them on your calendar because at least when they're on your calendar, others can see it you can keep mindful of it. And so you get to five out of eight. It's a conversation with your kids that mom's not gonna be at every single one. You know, there might be that basket that you miss, you know, but hopefully dad's there or a friend is there taking, you know, video recording, whatever it happens to be. And you're still gonna celebrate those triumphs with your kids. But, you know, we talked kind of in the, the pre-call a little bit about, you know, mommy guilt, right? You know, there's the, we put a lot upon ourselves in terms of, you know, what, we expect and i think over the you know tw if you just even go back 20 years and you think about social media and now you think about everybody's profiles and instagrams and work you know facebook's and how perfectly curated it is and looks like everybody's got it under control and nobody has a, a bad moment and and i think that that's we we set ourselves up with expectations of ourselves that quite truthfully aren't realistic they're, they're not necessary um, our kids, you know what, they're resilient. They turn out fine. You know, it's an op every, every misstep is an opportunity for, for conversation, for learning, not only for yourself, but also for your kids and, and role modeling. So, you know, I think we have to let up a little bit on ourselves in terms of some of those expectations that, that we said. And you know what, it's okay if mom has a job and it's okay if mom has to go somewhere and, you know, you, you work it out. 
I, I think that's sage advice. It's easier for me. It's easier said than done. I'll be honest. I am not great at that. I, I think I'm a little bit of a perfectionist, probably across the board. My team will be like rolling their eyes right now saying she's <laughs> not a perfectionist. But the the challenge of just sort of rolling with it as a mom and as a working mom, I don't know about you guys, but way back in the day, we didn't even like there was kind of this. I don't know this these moments where you kind of weren't supposed to have kids like I would have my girls um in the back of the car driving you know like you said Nicole pick up or something like that and being on a call and there there was no acceptance of like noise in the back from kids and so I'd be like you know telling my kids to, to be quiet I don't know if that's something that resonates with you all but certainly there's been a lot of changes as well in the workforce we got a question on this topic real quick on um, calendars, and I want to throw this in as we're talking about like pulling time out for ourselves, but there was a question around how do you manage staffing and scheduling and uh, you, given the holidays coming up, like how do you manage your own schedules and how do you handle managing staff coverage with the holidays? Any any thoughts on that? Anyone want to hit that one? I think I think it's important throughout the year to prepare for that, so it's not like I think about the coverage in December. Uh, I need to have leaders that I've mentored and, and, and prepared for covering me when I'm out throughout the year. And so uh, December is not an issue. We just make sure we have a discussion about the appropriate, you know, who's covering what and when. Because as you know, IT is 24 by 7. There is no relief in sight. Um, I take my calendar very personally. I live and die by the calendar, including my personal stuff, as Nicole has mentioned in the past. But also um, building in important time for whatever it is, like if it's um, you know reading contracts, or it doesn't have to be a meeting. Building other things in your in your calendar to make sure you can take care of the important things, including the personal events. And I think I do think sometimes, Kristen, the, as a leader, you may have to take some of the the shifts because it's the right thing to do as a leader, and so as Linda said, preparing for that ahead of time and maybe saying, okay, hey, what's our rotation this year going to be, especially as you talk about holidays or I think about spring break time of year, summer time of year. Those are times when everybody wants to make sure that they get time back. And, and I would say too, we need to make sure our people are getting their PTO. That also means ourselves. Um, so, you know, have you taken a vacation of more than two days in the last year? And if you haven't, you probably need to really think about it. Um, and that means planning. It, it does mean, you know, talking with the rest of the team, what's important to you, who has what milestones coming up? Does somebody have a 30 year anniversary that they want to celebrate next year? Get it on the calendar now so that you you have that communication. So it doesn't. Um, doesn't come down to the nth hour and then everyone's panicking. And I know that in the in the federal government, we always at the beginning of the year, it felt really weird, but we said everyone has to put in their PTO like now. And everybody's like, I don't know what I'm doing next November, but you had to do it in order to kind of keep on track. And it's not a bad habit to get into um, and something that I think we could do more of on, on the outside. Um, but that planning piece is so important. I love that. Uh, yes, yes, and yes. I, I want to switch gears a little bit. And so we talked before as we were prepping about, I, I forget how we kind of got into this like set topic around our superpowers, but the notion that there's a few things that you're pretty, you're, you're not bad at, like you kind of got them nailed and maybe others recognize you for that as well. I wanted to ask you guys about your superpowers, but as you're answering this, I'd also love your thoughts kind of from a superpower perspective. What are they? Have you had mentors that have helped you pull those out? Have you had other folks who've maybe said, hey, you know what? You may think that's a superpower, but not so much. <laughs> Talk to me about the role of maybe even a mentor and your superpowers and how they all fit together. Uh, let's see. I picked on Linda already first a few times. Maybe uh, Amy, you want to let us know. You're kind doing. for me. Um, <laughs> no, um, from a superpower perspective, you know, I, I tend to be a, a bit humble, and and so I don't I don't always see things in myself that that maybe others see in me, and I think that kind of goes maybe to where you're going with you know mentors or or people who 
can more succinctly call out or, or, or speak to, to some of your strengths. Um, one of the things I guess I feel that I, I do pretty well is just having an intuition about, you know, people, their intent, what's driving them, and really then being able to use that either in how we message or in how you coach somebody into dealing with a situation. You know, I think we all know that, you know, assume positive intent and, and things, but but when you're so aggravated with somebody because they're just not seeing it the way you do or, or coming at it from the same vantage point as you are, you know, it's it's easy sometimes to lose perspective of where somebody might be coming from and being able to kind of help, you know, open those blinds a little bit and, and help people see maybe that other perspective and where somebody's coming from to help bring that synergy together to work through things is is something that that I think I do pretty well. Um, but no, I, as far as mentors go, you know, I think there's lots of different types. There's ones that that have your back, you know, that that if something comes up, they're just going to have a good word to say about you. There's ones that maybe you sit down more formally with and, and actually do strategize around kind of, hey, I really want to get to this sort of spot. What do you recommend? How do how do I get there? I think there's value in lots of different types of mentor and support roles. And, you know, I, I recommend not pigeonholing into one particular type and look for the people in your network that can help, you know, support you, help you grow, help you become more self-aware, et cetera, regardless of where, you know, what that, how formal the relationship is, if you will. What about you, Nicole? Kristen, if I can build on that too. I, I think of someone who um, was a mentor and a champion. And I do think a champion is a little different maybe than a mentor. They can be both, but, um, and in the military, maybe it's a, a little bit more natural to have a champion because you stay in for a long time and you serve with people for a long time. And they're kind of always looking for good people to bring on their team. But I don't know if it's that different than the civilian world because I see a lot of that too in my colleagues of so and so who got a job at such and such place because someone at that place had worked with them previously and said, Linda, you were amazing. Why don't you come over here and help me? Um, and so I think that's kind of that mentor and champion. And I think of a, a general officer at one point who um, I still stay in touch with, but he told me, and I need to pull the words exactly because it is on one of my evaluation reports in my closet, actually. Um, but he basically told me, like, you really know how to tell someone that they are completely screwed up, but come across as if you're telling them the nicest thing ever. And they they leave understanding what they need to fix, but you also have made them feel good about themselves. He's like, it's a crazy thing. And that general officer did end up pulling me to assignments that normally, especially an army nurse, wouldn't get pulled to. And those things, you know, as long as I was willing and able to say yes, that made a huge difference in my career. Um, and I look at how I've gotten to certain jobs, certain places. I think it's always good to not burn bridges. I mean, you're not going to get along with everybody. You're not. And you're going to find that some people are more of a mentor to you than others. And you make those connections and you stay closer with some people over others. But I see right now as to, and I get calls a lot at Chime of, hey, I'm looking for a role. I need to leave my current job or they're doing layoffs or I just need a change. Do you know what's open? And so many times, it does boil down to who people knew, or at least they had exposure to someone and being able to just reconnect them. And I see a lot of progression happen that way, right or wrong. Um, you know, I don't think it always does happen just that the best qualified person gets a job because there's a lot of best qualified people out there. And so how do you set yourself apart? I think by having those mentor relationships, you really can do that. So. Um, and I think it is important to know your your strengths because you need to be the you're the person that has to hold those strengths up. No one else is really going to do it for you. Um, and being able to be comfortable in that 
and saying, no, I am really good at this and your company would, would benefit from it. You should bring me in because this is what I do really well. And that could be a company, it could be a project. Hey, I really want to do that project because it's my passion. Well, being able to express what your what your strengths are, which is uncomfortable for many of us, but like own it. Just be out there and say, yeah, I do this really well. You would be smart to bring me in and being comfortable saying that. Okay. Well, you hit on it. There's so many things you just said, Nicole. First of all, I, I have to thank you for your service. Like on behalf of everybody on this call, Wow, thank you so much. And I, I just finished reading a great book by Kristen Hanna, The Women. Uh, I, we mm, great book. On that, but if I you need this one. It, okay. You gotta read it. It's about army nurses and oh. kind of the whole, like during Vietnam, phenomenal book. Anybody on the call? But the the last point that you touched on, I swear everybody who's listening is like, what does this have to do with women in healthcare IT? The last point that you touched on around kind of being able to speak to our strengths, owning them as women, um, and being okay with sort of saying, hey, you know what? I know this. I got this. It, it's an interesting topic and one that I've read a lot about. There's a kind of a whole theory around why women, we, we feel like we don't necessarily want to own that strength. We want to sort of be, step, step step into it, but not just completely grab it um, by by the horns the way maybe a, uh, some of our male counterparts might. Linda, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I know you're an incredibly strong leader. How did how did you get past some of that? And what what does that mean for where you are right now? I think part of it is that, in my opinion, you know, and uh, you know, I'm I'm the Wonder Woman. Okay, that's my alter ego and. And um, I think it's number one, I, I, I want to be strong. I want to protect my people. I want to, and, and I, I have a boundless energy kind of picture that Wonder Woman, right? Um, I think what we do as women though, is, is we take it for granted that we're good at those things. I mean, that's just what I do. And it's just who I am and that's how I work. And I don't need to tell anybody that because we figure the world will see. That's mm -hmm. not always the case. And I think that's the difference. Most often what I see is men very much will market themselves, if you will, in a, in a different way than women, because we women just do the job, we do the thing, and we do it well, and we assume people will see. So I, that is one of the things that I think is important is for you to start marketing yourself, if, you, if that's the right word. I'm not sure, maybe there's another word for it, but um, not only do the great things, but remind people that you do the great things that gets you those opportunities to get different projects or get different opportunities or like Nicole meet you people like she mentioned. So I think that, I think that's the difference for me. So owning it, I just do it. You can't avoid it. I can't, I can't, they can't avoid me. I'm loud. I'm busy. I'm in everybody's stuff in a good way because I want to partner with everybody. Okay. My job as a leader is not just to do a technology. My job as a leader is to solve problems for the entire organization. So that's where um, that partnership amongst all the areas comes in. And hopefully they see that as the plus and, and then therefore they see the other strengths. You know, we're getting, a, we're getting questions here uh, kind of around this notion of how do I, like, sometimes I feel trapped in my career. How do I grow? How do I move past that? And I, I'm hearing tenants of that in all of the different pieces that we're covering here today. This notion of like, kind of being okay, speaking up for yourself, seeing the opportunity, going for it. Um, I definitely think that there's been times in my career, you guys have probably seen this where, hey, I'm doing the job. I got it. But sometimes that doesn't get you to the next level. Right. Like it's it, it actually means that, hey, well, Kristen's doing a great job. Why would I want to move her or break something that that's that's not broken? It's certainly a challenge as we think about our careers. And um, I want to understand a little bit about kind of what elements from a career perspective, maybe even help define who you are today. And how has that kind of helped move things along for you? Uh, how about Linda? You want to start this off? Sure. I, I think there's two things. Um, number one, I've always taken the work that nobody else wants. And I know that doesn't sound right. And no, I know it sounds like, well, that's sloppy leftovers or sloppy seconds, right? But for me, it's always been, uh, I'll, I'll give HIPAA as an example. Nobody wanted to take that, that um, monkey on their back and deal with all the policies and all the security and all the data and all the integrations with every single department in the organization. Nobody else like wanted to mess with that. 
Well, I took it. And by doing that, I met so many departments and learned so many workflows and so many processes that, um, that it was a turning point in my career. So first of all, I always suggest take the work nobody else wants. And if, you, if there's something you really want, of course, volunteer for that too. But you never know where those things are going to really make you shine. And then, um, and then market that. Remind people, here's what I did and here's how I did it. And then always ask questions. I ask a ton of questions. And if you ask it in a way that feels supportive and not accusatory, I think it goes a long way for um, not only showing interest in those around you, but the topics. And you learn, you constantly learn. 100% on that one. And Nicole, and your thoughts on that, we're, we're getting a question as well, which kind of touches on some of this as well, that women are frequently do invisible work. I think a lot of people do, um, not just women, but what happens when you're, when you're stuck in those roles, doing the invisible work with a lot of tests and you're, you know, killing it, but how, how do you call it out? So, you know, as you're thinking about maybe your example, what moment in your career helped define who you are today, how did you create, how did you make that moment of pull it out and help it really kind of supercharge uh, your career? Yeah, this is a, when we when we talked about this in kind of the prep, it took a different frame. I had a different frame around it. But as you're asking about like, how do you get to that next step? I and it's hard because a lot of times you are doing. And my example was sort of dealing with the COVID emergency and having experience in the military with sort of emergency preparedness, emergency response. We also have the, I I think it's a luxury here of having the Sturgis motorcycle rally every fall. And whenever we have the motorcycle rally, we actually um, grow our state population by half of what it is. So South Dakota is just a little under a million people and in the whole state. And during the rally, we get an extra around 500,000 people coming in just to one, one city um, on our side of the state. And so we had a lot of, we did disaster preparedness every year for that rally. So we pulled on, I pulled on a lot of things to put together our COVID response. And you're right, there were points where it's like, well, why am I not the person getting interviewed for CNN? Why is it the VPMA just because he's the physician, he's not doing all this work. Why am I not getting the accolades? And I had to sort of like stop myself and say like, that's okay, like everyone has a part. Um, but I also think that if you're, you know, these the, the folks asking the question about feeling stuck, there's something there you can't ignore either. Like we all get to a point in our career where, if you're really not feeling valued or not feeling fulfilled, and it could be one or the other, it could be a combination, like you need to sit down with your leader and say like, hey, this isn't really working. Like, how do I, how do I get there from here? Um, in the end, in that COVID example, I ended up definitely getting recognized by our medical staff later, and it was more private. It wasn't national TV, but it was, the, the chief of the med staff coming to me and he like, and, and you all have worked with probably physician leaders. Um, they often don't have time and don't take time to, to thank people, but he had made up his own certificate. He brought it to my office, like presented it to me saying, thank you so much for everything you did. And it was like, okay, it didn't go unnoticed. It really didn't. But, but I think it's this, again, we go back to balance balance in this is important too. Maybe it's okay that not everyone is is outwardly recognizing the work you're doing. Are you happy with it? Is your leader happy with it? Is your team happy with it? And that you can gain a lot of satisfaction from if you get to that point, I think where, hey, this just isn't working. I recognize it, have a conversation about it, bring it out in the open, work with your leader to address that. Maybe it's bringing on a different project. Maybe it's adding something to your role that you don't have today to feel like, okay, maybe I'm contributing more. Maybe it's a job change. Maybe it's, hey, I, I just can't do this anymore and I need to do something different. I think that if you're willing to work in an organization, your leaders are always looking to, to retain you. Um, you know, I think people always want to retain folks. It's and and having them maybe change what they're doing 
is a much easier way to retain them to, than to find out that they leave and six weeks later you find out, oh my gosh, I didn't even know that they were feeling unfulfilled or they felt like they weren't getting recognized. That makes you feel so bad because you could have saved it, you could have tried, you could have changed something. So I, I don't know, I'm trying to address kind of both those questions and um, I go back to balance as finding that right balance for those things. Bringing it back to balance. Honestly, like we scheduled a 45 minute webinar here. I feel like we could have, we should have scheduled like two hours. There, there are so many questions I'm get, we're getting so much engagement, by the way. Thank you everybody for all your questions. We have to kind of wrap up, but I want to, I want to ask one question. I want the three of you to kind of weigh in on this and that is advice. Uh oh. Did we lose Kristen? <laughs> I think we lost Kristen, but I think I know where she's going. Um, I think the the intent is is you know what piece of advice would we have for for aspiring leaders? So I you know I, I swear we're gonna get start technology there. and leadership here. Uh, but what's your advice for others? And Amy, will you start? Sure. Um, so one of the things, and and I'm maybe embarrassed to say that that this is back in my consulting days. I actually had a client tell me this and. Keep in mind that I was, you know, 20 something barely. I was on the road. I was new in consulting on a project all by myself and asked to do something completely outside my comfort zone. But um, I did my very best. I put in the work. I created the deliverable that was requested, but I kept apologizing kept apologizing that that maybe it didn't meet their expectations or didn't meet their needs or whatever. And and finally, you know, the 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 person I was working for said, stop, you know, you did you put in your best effort? Did you do the best you could with the what you had, the circumstances that you had? If those answers are yes, there's no apology needed. If you do something wrong, if you offend somebody, if you you know, really make a blunder. Of course, you need to apologize. That that's not where I'm going. But but don't apologize for your earnest, best effort, hard work. That that's that's that is what you do. We do not need to apologize for that. And I think, especially as women, you know, the sorry, sorry, you know, like the the walking on eggshells thing can can maybe become second nature. And um, it, have confidence in what you put forward as your best work product. Nicole. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. Yeah, I, I think that um, we've we've said a couple things that I always repeat, especially to younger people, like my high school, my daughter's high school friends and um, people as I talk to schools and, and things like that about, you know, number one, have a plan. Um, number two, be willing to take risks. And I think we've talked about both those things today. And my third one is that it is all about relationships and um, not to though let people take advantage of you. And I think Linda, when you were saying um, market yourself, I, I, the word that came to my mind was advocate for yourself too. Um, and, and sometimes marketing is advocating, um, but don't let people take advantage of you and make sure that you are are establishing your wants, your needs, your expectations of a project, a relationship, um, a role that you may be given um, and, and really then cultivate those relationships with people and really give time to them because um, they don't just happen organically and stay strong over time you do have to feed those so i think the piece about the relationship building is my my piece of advice linda um i would say one of the things i would say is always learn you're always learning keep exploring whether that's in technology outside technology leadership and personal you know for me it's yoga or health or whatever so take the time to continue to learn your entire life because you never know where those things are going to they're going to shape you they're going to shape your leadership um, the other thing I would say is find your authentic self because, you know, I grew up in the 80s and I started my career in the 80s where women at the time dressed like men and we were supposed to look like men in the in the workplace and we wore suits and ties and, you know, different kind of ties. But that's what we did until we realized that, boy, women can be different and special leaders in and of themselves. And, you know, some of my yoga comes into my leadership and some of my personal life has changed how I am a leader. So I 
embrace whatever it is that brings you to this place, whether that's the education experience, the fun things you do on the side, all of that, and just make, you know, bring, create your own sense of leadership. Okay. I Words to live by, guys. So thank you so much, But first of all, for, for joining our panel. Everybody who's been listening in, I we can't thank you enough. I, I really do believe we could probably wax poetic here for another couple of hours. Uh, so we may just have to get this group back together again, but I will tell you that we appreciate, we certainly appreciate our customers and our partners, Chime and uh, the folks over there, Linda, you and your team out there in Ohio, Amy, Advocate Aurora, I mean, golly guys, thank you so much for, for joining and for leaning in and everybody else for all your phenomenal questions. Thank you very much. Have a great Tuesday. Take thank care. You, thank you. Bye guys. Bye.